I have been particularly looking forward to this one uh, because it is featuring my own colleagues as the featured speakers. And we are here to, to contemplate this question of whether citizenship requires sacrifice. And it is a question that uh, I have wrestled with for a long time, both as a scholar and as a citizen, uh, without closure. So again, I'm particularly interested to hear what my colleagues have to say about this. Now, um, some of our students may be wondering whether extra credit requires sacrifice. <laughs> And I do have a definitive answer to that now. No. Uh, this, this is worth the walk in the cold from anywhere, from anywhere. So I'm glad that we're all here together today. Um, I want to offer some thanks before I have a few brief remarks to make about the uh, structure and the content of the program here. I want to thank the Dean's Office for supporting the series and, and also for their technical support, the Information and Computing Technology Group, uh, in particular Matt Coulter, uh, uh, who has helped uh, us today. Um, I also want to note the contributing sponsorship from the Sawyer Law and Politics Program and also the sponsorship through the 10th Decade Fund um, from Stephen Haggerty and Lisa Altenburned, Haggerty Consulting, Walter Montgomery and Marion Gruber, and Finsbury LLC. Uh, the, the 10th Decade Fund is going to be uh, supporting and sponsoring a number of events and conversations related to citizenship in various ways over the coming years, and we're delighted to be one of the first ones. I also want to give my thanks as well to Bethany Wallowender and Kelly Coleman, who work in the Campbell Institute and helped to put together these events. And in particular, I want to give a separate shout out to Bethany Wallowender because it was her original idea to do an event in this series explicitly focused on citizenship. I have one important additional announcement before I have a few things to say about the content, uh, and that is to please, and it was a perfect segue there, silence all phones and ringing devices, anything that makes an alert sound. So our format this afternoon is that uh, each of the panel members will offer some brief introductory remarks on the question, and then we'll take a bit of time for them to react to what they've heard each other say, maybe challenge, pose some questions. Uh, I may ask a few questions or insert a comment into that process. And then after that, we will ask you to join in, and we want to hear your questions and your brief comments. Now, the way we'll do this is the way we've done it in the past. Um, I'll ask for uh, you to raise your hand if you're interested in contributing. And we have two microphones, so I'm going to call on two people at a time. Um, please wait for the microphone to be passed to you before you speak so that you are part of our live stream and also part of the archive of this program. And then when you're done speaking, give the microphone back, please, to the person <laughs> who gave it to you. And then after we've heard from the first two folks, we'll do the whole process over again and we'll cycle through that. Until uh, we get to the end of time. Um, we'll uh, repair to the foyer after that for a nice reception where we can continue this important conversation about citizenship and sacrifice. Now let me say just a couple words about the topic at hand. Um, part of my own background is in democratic political theory, and those theorists have debated this question about sacrifice for centuries, also without closure. And there are many views on this. Um, one minimalist view holds that citizenship does not require sacrifice. It only requires voting occasionally, and that that minimalism makes sense and is actually the sign of social health and political satisfaction among the population. And it's a good thing, then, that most things that are political are delegated to others who have the level of interest and competency to sustain that effort. Now, having said that, I must also note that large groups in American society have sacrificed greatly at different points in our history to realize even this minimalist view. There is another more activist view that such delegation is actually alienation and that citizenship requires consistent active involvement in the policymaking process and real access 
to the resources to undertake that. It wants to take a romantic view of ancient Athens and make it real. So citizenship asks a lot all the time. Most days I fall somewhere in between, but today I am coming to this conversation fresh and ready to listen. And my colleagues may be taking this question in completely different directions that I'm unaware of, and I look forward to discovering what those are. So let me give you just the briefest introduction of our speakers, and I do mean very, very brief. What I want to say just about all of them collectively and as individuals is each and every one of them are colleagues that uh, I respect greatly, and I have learned from each one of them. So I'm looking forward to doing that again today. And the order in which they will offer their initial remarks, and I guess they're, they're lined up in that way too, so that's good. Um, Christy Anderson is a Chapel Family Professor of Citizenship and Democracy, and she's a professor in the Political Science Department. Walter Brodnax is Distinguished Professor of Public Administration and International Affairs. Tina Nabachi is an Associate Professor of Public Administration and International Affairs. And Robert Rubenstein is a Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs. So having said that, Christy, take it away. Well, I'm going to answer the question partly for the sake of argument by saying no. Democracy does not involve, does not demand sacrifice. Um, some assumptions first. I'm talking particularly about democratic citizenship not just citizenship in a monarchy or a tyranny. And I'm talking not just about citizenship in the nation state, but about citizenships, kind of plural, acknowledging that each of us is a citizen in an array of communities, including the city of Syracuse, the towns that some of us live in or grew up in, New York State, as well as the United States and other countries of which we are citizens. Democratic citizenship is based on consent, and I think Grant's political theorists all agree on that. We've, we've all consented in some sense, uh, or at least our forebearers consented, and this creates a, a kind of mutual obligation among members of a, the society, that, which is governed by a democracy. Everybody who receives the protection of, of the society or the polity owes a return for this benefit, and this is, you know, fairly, I mean, this is not my theory, this is, you know, fairly conventional democratic theory. John Stuart Mill says, for example, and the fact of living in a society renders it indispensable that each person should be bound to exercise a certain line of conduct toward the rest, that is not injuring others or the, uh, damaging the interests of others, and also each, each one needs to assume part of the collective burden of protecting the so society and its members, and that might be interpreted as being sacrificed, but I'm gonna argue it's really not necessarily best seen that way. So we do have responsibilities as citizens, um, and I would agree with that. The question then is, does responsibility entail sacrifice? Uh, you know, when we have responsibilities for our families and our friends and even our pets, and I'll use that example. So one way that I sacrifice something every day is I sacrifice my ability to stay safely inside a warm house when the wind chill is zero for the sake of my dog who wants to go outside and needs exercise. But properly considered, I don't think this is a sacrifice for a number of reasons. Um, and one reason is because in the long range, in the long term, I'm much happier and healthier when I take his needs into consideration and behave accordingly. That is, spend 45 minutes in the afternoon snowshoeing or walking or whatever I'm doing, rather than taking a more narrowly selfish, selfish position. That is, oh, it's too cold, can't go out. Just walk out the door and then come back. So this is, I'm looking at a broader version of my, uh, interests here, and this is, I would argue, thus not a sacrifice. But let's go beyond pets, and, and so we can consider another specific example in my life. Um, you know, the various communities I live in make collective decisions, which are going to result in public policies that have some impact on me. So the village I live in uh, has considered an application to build a brewery, a brew farm actually, just down the road from my house in a beautiful farm field, completely empty. I walk my dog, again the dog appears, through the field where this will be built most days of the week. It's beautiful, a gorgeous place to walk. Uh, much of it will be turned into 
farm fields, a parking lot, and a building if this approval is, goes through. And so in my narrow self-interest, again, I should not want this to be there. I want to preserve my life the way it is. I want to preserve these nice places to walk. I don't want noise. I don't want trucks. I don't want parking lots. But because I've thought about this a lot and talked to a lot of people about it and talked to a number of neighbors, because I'm an active democratic citizen of this particular community, I see beyond this daily walk. I see beyond the trucks. I try to understand the views of my neighbors. I consider the positive impact on the local community and the local economy. And I support the brewery, despite the inconvenient changes it will bring to my particular narrow life. This is what Tocqueville called self-interest rightly understood. Or uh, again, we sometimes refer to this as enlightened self-interest. So it's still in my, I'm, I'm defining this as in my self-interest, um, even though there are ways in which it would be called uh, acting against my self-interest. Tocqueville thought Americans were particularly good at coming to this sort of judgment. He said, the Americans are fond of explaining almost all the actions of their lives by the principle of interest rightly understood. They show with complacency how an enlightened regard for themselves constantly prompts them to assist each other and inclines them willingly to sacrifice a portion of their time and property to the welfare of the state. So with this concept of, of self-interest rightly understood, it may be possible to think that acting unselfishly as a democratic citizen, or at least not wholly selfishly as a democratic citizen, is not a sacrifice. It's, it's simply part of your responsibilities as a citizen, and if you look at it properly, you're not really sacrificing, making, having a loss, incurring a loss. And that's why I could say no to the question. But there's an additional point. I think I can take this a little bit further before I finish. Um, I would argue that participation and involvement in civic life also confers not just these indirect benefits on me because I'm part of this local economy, for example, but direct benefits on those who engage in um, civic and political life. And, and many democratic theorists talk specifically about this, that uh, they look at participation, certainly voting, but not only voting, primarily as a way of protecting private interests, but many of them also look at participation in participatory institutions, so voting, local government, public hearings, campaigns, as having a beneficial educative effect on us as individuals. Um, some theorists, like Rousseau, for example, talk about how during the process of being involved in community life, in public discussions, an individual finds that she has to take into account others. Uh, she has to take into account matters wider than her own uh, private interests. She learns to be a public as well as a private citizen. She learns to negotiate. The more the citizen participates, the better and more effective she is able to be as a participant. She's a better and smarter person in a sense. And I would take this one step further than that even and say that we are social beings and the drive to cooperate with other people, to help other people is really hardwired in us. So in thinking of our mutual responsibilities as sacrifice, which we were asked to do I think today, something that violates our essentially selfish nature, I think that's wrong. I mean, I think we're not sacrificing when we act to cooperate with others and come to collective decisions. We benefit, learn, and grow from interacting with others, cooperating with others, and taking others' perspectives into account, which we must do when we are being democratic citizens. And I think this is, in a sense, the opposite of, opposite of sacrifice. Thank you. Walter? I, uh, I, I want to take a little different tack, if you will, in terms of the remarks that I had this afternoon. And, and that is, is that I, I've chosen rather than to depersonalize or, or, or make them, in some cases, even more abstract uh, than uh, uh, the material that led us into this, uh, is to talk about some of the memories that this, this set in motion for me uh, and uh, brings life and meaning to uh, the topic itself, at least from my point of view. Um, and I'm a couple of small vignettes in terms of a man now who is, um, I was fortunate enough to turn 70 years of age my last birthday, 
And you can all tell me later on at the reception how I don't look like that. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, that uh, I look like a young, bouncing fellow of, you know, 55 or something, <laughs> something like that, which looks pretty darn good right now. Um, but to maybe three little vignettes from my life, and this is personalized, and it's about Walter Broadnax and how he came to have the view that he has. It's so I'm sure that some people will disagree, others may uh, sympathize, depending on what their background uh, is. Um, the first one takes place in McGee, Arkansas. I don't know if there are any Arkansans in the in the room, but uh, I was about 11 years old, and uh, it was during those times in my life where each summer uh, my mother and father would either put us on the train and ship us to Arkansas to spend time with my grandmother, or my mother would escort us uh, to McGee, Arkansas to spend time um, with my grandmother. And so this was one of those summers, and I was about 11 years of age and really enjoying my time with my grandmother. My grandmother was my fishing buddy. Uh, she was the person, sort of my, my moral conscience. Uh, uh, she played a tremendous role uh, in my life and, and my ability to see uh, what was going on around me. So it's Saturday, and uh, particularly in the South at that time, people would go shopping on Saturdays. So Grandma said, okay, uh, let's get the pickup out, and we're going to go into town and, and do some shopping. So off we go into town. I'm there with her, happy as I can be to be with my granny, uh, who I just thought the world of, and into town we go. We get out of the pickup in front of a Safeway uh, grocery store, which I'll never forget. And she said, grandson, I want you to stand here and wait for me. Uh, and I'm gonna pick up just a few items in here. I don't really need that much. Uh, and then we'll go on down the street and, and I'll finish my shopping. So I was standing there and there was this another pickup backed into the curb and there was a, a young girl uh, I don't know how old she was, but uh, probably maybe a little bit older than I was, in the back of the pickup. And so I'm standing there waiting for my grandmother, and the girl smiled at me, and I smiled at the young girl, smiled back. Well, the next thing I know, I am down on the sidewalk uh, outside of this Safeway store uh, with this policeman all over me. Uh, and he's trying to hit me with his baton, but I'm smaller, much smaller than he is, and I'm able to keep getting between his legs and underneath him, and so he couldn't get a good shot uh, at me. My grandmother came out of the store, uh, and you can imagine she was quite distressed. She jumped onto the policeman and got him onto his back, and then sitting astride him said, if you're going to hurt my grandson, you're going to have to kill me. Now, and so she gets up, he sort of looks around, and I don't know whether he's embarrassed or what, and people sort of return to what they were doing, uh, shopping and so forth, um, and the policeman went on his way, and my grandmother and I went on our way. Everybody in this little vignette understood their roles that roles and conditioning of how you deal with situations like this in the context of a democracy where people have rights and responsibilities. And we could spend the night talking about what in the hell were our rights uh, and were they exercised uh, in this uh, vignette that I've shared with you. That's vignette one. Vignette two, I'm now uh, about 14 years of age. And I'm going to be making my first trip to Arkansas uh, uh, sort of on my own. I've got to take care of my little brother. So that's almost like being by yourself in a lot of ways. But uh, uh, we got on the train, or we were going to get on the train, and we're in the depot. 
And I looked up and I hadn't noticed before, but there's a big sign in the depot. And on one side of the sign, it says, colored only. And on the other side, it said, white only. And I hadn't noticed it before. And I, I needed to go to the men's room and I got up and I started into the wrong. Now this is in the train station in my hometown. So I'm not visiting away and I've been in this station many times, but I hadn't noticed the signs, which I think is very interesting. But I get ready to go to the bathroom and it looked like I was going to go into, I guess, the white only bathroom. And zoom, there was somebody there saying, oh no, 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 you, the, you can't go in there. You got, you got to go in over here. This, you, and so go in there. So I went into the, to the uh, colored only side and waited and uh, used the bathroom and came out and there was the person still there. Uh, to make sure that I wasn't going to be using any of the other amenities in the railroad station uh, that were uh, set aside for uh, white patrons. Um, that really sunk into me, and I thought, what a, a strange sort of thing to do. Uh, why is this so very important and people are taking it uh, uh, so seriously? And talking to people in the station, waiting on the train to come. And a gentleman pointed out to me, this is a black gentleman, he said that it is, it, it is important uh, for, for white people to know where you are and what you're doing uh, and whether you're doing the right thing. And so this is all a part of the, that reassurance uh, that that is transpiring. Uh, I thought, well, my goodness, that's that's quite a quite a thing to do. Well, uh, that's the way we do it, and and that's what we have accepted, and that's what they expect uh, uh, from us. Last one. Uh, when I entered school, I've always loved uh, education, and my parents not having a lot of it. My mother went to high school, which was a really big deal. Uh, at the time that she did that, uh, my father, third grade, uh, I say third grade, he said three years. Uh, he said, I went to school three years. I said, well, third grade. He said, he said, son, I don't know whether it's third grade or fifth grade or what. I went three years, and when I got to be a big boy, uh, they came and got me, and I went to the fields to go to work. Uh, and that's, he worked like a dog for the rest rest of his life, that was, the, and that was his, there it was, that, that was the future uh, cut out uh, for, for him. So, uh, yeah, so I go to go off to school uh, and I'm excited about it, that I'm getting to go to school. 1949 and boy, I'm ready to go. I can't, I've been waiting to get into this. And it's the first day of class. And my kindergarten teacher, uh, Mrs. Callahan, I can still remember her name, um, got all the children in the kindergarten class to get in a circle. And so we got in a circle in the room and she said, uh, I'm doing this because I want everybody to be aware that we have a, a guest, a visitor in our classroom. And I thought, I wonder who the visitor and the guest is in the classroom, and she said, um, um, she used my middle name, which is Doyce, not and Walter, and said, come here. And uh, she pulled out a little stool, and she said, I want you to step up on the stool so the kids can see you. And they were in a circle. And said, uh, we have uh, a, a Negro boy going to be in our class, uh, and this is, this is him. Uh, he will be with us, uh, and I wanted you all to be able to see him, and I want you to be kind to him, and you know, and so forth, because uh, he's going to be with us the the entire uh, year. And so it's our jobs to try to make him feel comfortable. Now you can imagine for a four-year-old child with this kind of attention 
and to some extent scrutiny, how comfortable that would, would make you. Well, I took to becoming a runaway from school. I would run away from school all the damn time. I'd run away and go home and then have to confront my father who was threatening to kill me if I didn't go back to a school. And then the people in school want to know where was I. And I finally gave up on running away. I was losing uh, this thing. But again, it's so complicated because one of the constants in this, these three scenarios always is tremendous emphasis on our responsibilities for peace and being able to get along and to deal with the environment. I mean, all these things that we were shouldering at the same time with this very strong signal that we didn't belong, that we were a problem, that people had to come up with this adjustment so that we could be in the community. And that, that really weighs on you. Um, and, uh, and, and as I said, I remember it uh, even now. So that's, that's the way I come to this. Uh, I would say that the, the sharing uh, of the weight or the burden for making the community function well has to be equally sort of distributed. And until that happens, um, we, we are going to find it, I think, very difficult to, to get our arm around this subject in terms of a practical sense, uh, in terms of having uh, communities that work well for the members of the community. Thank you. Uh, so, does citizenship require sacrifice? This was the question posed to the panel for today's State of Democracy lecture, and I must confess, sorry Grant, I immediately disliked this question. <laughs> To me, the word sacrifice conjured images of offerings to ancient deities on ancient altars, which might be appropriate for this Friday the 13th, um, but is certainly less suitable for a conversation about citizenship. And to be sure that I wasn't obtuse and being silly, I looked up the word sacrifice in the dictionary. Uh, and lo and behold, the first definition offered was an act of killing a person or animal in a religious ceremony as an offering to please a god. Uh, my dislike of the question grew. Nor was I pleased with the second definition of the word sacrifice, the act of giving up something you want to keep, especially in order to get or do something else. Using this definition, the question posed to the panel becomes, does citizenship require a person to give up something of value, to experience a loss, a deprivation, a forfeiture of something meaningful and treasured? And I object to that line of questioning. I believe the framing is wrong. It is subtly but dangerously misleading. The question posed that way encourages us to think about citizenship from an individual perspective, a perspective based on self-interest, not necessarily enlightened self-interest. Um, and it really drives us away from what I believe is the essence of citizenship, attachment, belonging, and community. Um, to be sure, conceptions of citizenship have changed over time. The definitions of citizenship, the characteristics, its determining factors, these have evolved and they continue to evolve. And today, these, these, I, the ideas of citizenship are still very culture specific, very society specific. Nevertheless, in my opinion, I think there is at least one truth that is embedded in the ideal of citizenship, and that is that citizenship is a bond that not only bestows a special status among people, but it's a bond that uh, goes beyond family, goes beyond genetics to unite people. It's a bond that confers membership among equals in a community. And in our increasingly diverse societies, citizenship may be the only bond that we can all collectively share. In some cases, the bond of citizenship provides for legal rights and protections. Um, and these rights and protections often become the basis of discussions about citizenship. Um, but in my view, the bond of citizenship also requires certain commitments. 
Um, and I will return to this point in a moment, but first let me say again that I object to the sacrificial framing. Uh, we should not be asking what we lose to have the rights of citizenship, but rather we should ask what do we gain for having the privileges of citizenship and what commitments are we all willing to make to retain those benefits? And I think this argument becomes clearer um, with an admittedly overly simplistic analysis of uh, two different conceptions of citizenship. So first, there's a liberal conception of citizenship, and in that conception, the individual reigns supreme. Citizens are seen as sovereign, autonomous beings that act out of enlightened self-interest, uh, often with the primary goal of economic be benefit. Um, and those citizens have some obligations, for example, paying taxes and obeying the law. Uh, they are essentially seen as being politically passive beings, since their private lives take precedence over their public lives. And in this view, the state then exists for the benefit of individuals and has the primary goal of creating an environment that enables citizens to pursue their own personal interests without fear of impingement on their rights. Uh, in contrast, the classical view of citizenship sees individuals not as economic beings, but rather as political beings. Uh, private lives and public lives are not separated as they are in the liberal conception, but rather they're one and the same. The individual in the classical conception finds meaning through her connection to the polis or the polity. Um, uh, and in this conception, the driving force is not the rights given to citizens, though those certainly exist, but rather the obligations of citizens towards their community. And the logic is very simple. One's personal destiny is inextricably linked to the destiny of the community as a whole. So I realize that these uh, descriptions of conceptions of citizenship are very simplistic, but hey, back off, I only have five minutes. Um, and I hope that you're catching kind of the essence of my argument here. And to be clear, I'm not arguing against individual rights, I'm not arguing for socialism, I'm not arguing for anything like that. What I am arguing is that we need to all commit to ensuring that we retain the rights and privileges of citizenship and to, and to ensuring that we uphold the ideals of citizenship. And for me, that requires a commitment to being active and informed members of our communities, however we define those. And this means more than just voting. It means standing up and stepping forward to do what's necessary and to do what, what is right. It means cultivating our civic virtues. It means reinvigorating our sense of civic duty and becoming more active citizens in our communities. And I believe that a first step towards doing that is to recognize that voting, paying taxes, obeying the law, sitting on a jury, these are not sacrifices. These are the commitments we all make to protect our freedoms and liberties, to protect our ideals of democracy, and to protect our status as citizenship. And to call these commitments sacrifices, in my opinion, greatly dishonors those who fought and sometimes died for the rights of citizenship. To ensure to assert that these, these commitments are equivalent to a personal loss, deprivation, or forfeiture is, in my opinion, a grievous slight. The right to vote, freedom of speech, freedom of religion and assembly, the right to a fair trial, and every other right you can imagine is neither absolute nor God-given. People fought and continue to fight. People die and continue to die to hold these rights. These rights do not just appear. Uh, they are earned in long and arduous struggles. If we take these rights and privileges for granted, and if we come to believe that they are tasks that we have to suffer the burden of, then we really are at risk of loss, of deprivation, and of forfeiture. The freedoms, the rights, the privileges bestowed upon us by citizenship will not last unless we all, each and every one of us, commit to protecting them. So with that in mind, I want to reframe the question and I want to ask not does citizenship require sacrifice, but rather what commitments are you willing to make to retain the bonds of citizenship along with all of the rights and privileges and benefits that come with it? Thank you for participating, even though you hated the question. <laughs> <laughs> I disliked it. I didn't hate. <laughs> Robert, do you, do you need to come up here? Were you going to go up there? I'm going to let you push the button when I need it. Oh, OK. <clears throat> you want me to? But not until the end. Oh, OK. Just stay where you are, Grant. OK. All right. OK. You've got to get ready. Go. OK. <laughs> OK, so the question that was posed to us today, which is, does citizenship require sacrifice, is deceptively simple. But once we begin to consider what citizenship might mean and what sacrifice might mean, then our subject gets a lot more complex. So I'm going to offer three sets of propositions from my particular anthropological perspective to reframe this question. 
The first set of propositions has to do with what we think about political groups. The second is about sacrifice and social life. And the third is about the importance of considering scope and scale when we talk about things like citizenship. So there's three sets of propositions. Each set has nine propositions. Everything's very symmetrical here. Well, I guess not if there's three. Never mind. OK. <laughs> the ethnographic record shows us that people solve the political challenge of living together using a vast variety of political processes, only some of which look like the democratic political organizations and institutions with which we are familiar in the United States. Secondly, people structure their relationships with others by creating categories of inclusion and exclusion in political life, and through those categories, they exercise political power. Third, groups are created through the construction of social and symbolic boundaries, and these provide mechanisms for mobilizing and managing collective action in a wide number of domains, whether it's labor, the use of resources, the creation of force, or the expression of morality, and those are just some examples. Fourthly, groups also serve to secure material and other benefits for their members, and at times to exclude non-group members from access to those goods. Fifth, inclusion in such political groups comes when a person sees themselves as a member of that group and is also recognized by others as belonging to that group. So the practical consequences of such actions are reflected in the sectarian competition and strife that we can see in many countries and in many other regions of the world and even in our own. So from an anthropological perspective, there are many different arrangements through which people come to see themselves as members of a political community who enjoy the rights and assume the duties of membership in that group. And we can take that as a broad definition of citizenship. Anthropologists recognize a wide variety of the kinds of citizenship. For instance, in our literature, you'll see rec references to economic citizens, ethnic citizens, multicultural citizens, proxy citizens. It goes on. Anthropologists are great at, at creating these kinds of categories. So a state citizen would be someone who is a member of a political community defined by the, uh, by the state and who thus gains the rights and duties of membership in that state's political, uh, the political benefits that it provides. We can expand on that during our conversation, but I want to turn to sacrifice, not a category that I dislike as much as Tiener. So sacrifice is a category of social action that is mainly found in studies of religious traditions, although some anthropologists assert that it is a central category for understanding human social life more generally. And it involves giving something of value, usually to invisible forces or to manifest agents. And giving something of value can be almost anything. It can be money, goods, services, sacrificing animals, and yes, even rarely, sacrificing human beings. So sacrifice is given in the hope of influencing those invisible forces or agents to act in ways that one would like. It often marks off the sacred from the profane, and even in the sense of, of, uh, of the remarks that, uh, that Tina just made, I think I, it's fair to say that we can often hear uh, citizenship thought of as a kind of sacred honor, one that is sanctified through sacrifice. Sacrifice in that context creates the conditions for inclusion and exclusion from sacred political communities. So I think that sacrifice is one way that citizens assert their entitlement and access the benefits of group membership. So let me turn now briefly to questions of scope and scale. Nearly everyone makes sacrifices or commitments to enjoy the rights that citizenship brings. I think that paying taxes is a sacrifice. Some political groups in which people claim citizenship are larger than others. Some are like nation states, which I'll call that kind of citizenship civic citizenship, just for a shorthand. Smaller political groups, uh, sac in smaller political groups, sacrifice brings relatively equal access to all group members. 
So in civic citizenship, promise is to enfranchise people so as to legitimate their claims to the benefits that citizenship promises. Membership in other citizen groupings challenges some people's ability to claim the benefits of civic citizenship. For example, and Reed, this is where you, Grant, this is where you can put the, uh, sorry, uh, just push the unmute. For example, our empirical research in Syracuse shows clear inequities in access to benefits. There it is. This is a map of gunshots and gun murders created by our Neighborhood Trauma Due to Violence Research Group. And it shows that sacrifices in some areas of the city are of a quite different kind than they are in others. It just so happens that the areas affected by gun violence are pretty much coextensive with maps of Syracuse <clears throat> that show these citizens lacking access to healthy food, having greater levels of lead poisoning, fewer economic opportunities, especially for teens, greater proportions of single female headship, and many other burdens. So let me conclude by saying that citizenship is experienced differently by different peoples. And so while perhaps all people sacrifice in some way for their citizenship, there are some who are both metaphorically and literally sacrificed. Thank you. Great. Thanks to all of you. Um, so, yeah. so I want to take about, I want to take about maybe 15 minutes if we can. That still leaves a healthy amount of time for uh, audience Q&A. But for, to see if the, if, if the four of you have reactions to what you've heard from your colleagues. Anyone wants to jump in, pose a question, frame a comment? I heard a lot of overlap. I heard some tension. Um, let me just open it up to the group. Anybody want to jump in? I say that the way Tina and I approached it, and I, I think we were in a, she in a more forceful way than I, but we were kind of saying some of the same things, that we objected to the notion of sacrifice rather than commitment. I, I do think that our, for this purpose, our consideration of citizenship um, sort of, you know, it, it was in a way that didn't acknowledge the inequalities that Walter talked about or that um, Robert talked about. So, and I... In, in another five minutes, I could do that, but yeah. So I think we're looking at it in somewhat different ways, and you, you'd you have to rethink a lot of these things. One thing I wanted to question is, though, Robert, you, you, you really equated commitment to sacrifice, which Tina was ob objecting to, and I think I would object to that, too. Well, I... I it's not in my notes. I, I just did that because Tina mentioned commitment, but <laughs> but I think I think of taxes as uh, which she mentioned as a commitment, as also a sacrifice. So I'm not married uh, to uh, calling commitment sacrifice, but there are some commitments that we have that do cause us to give up things in order to get things that we would like, and in that sense, it would be a sacrifice. It's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. It's a sacrifice. It's enlightened self-interest, but it, it is still giving up something. Anything else from the group? Well, just even, I mean, the, the point there on, I think, is a, is a good one, and, and I think is is not as visible in, in, in my remarks about in terms of the vignettes, but I think is important, a um, uh, very important part of it uh, in terms of the exchange, of getting into the exchange. So I'm giving $5, and it's my taxes for my house. Well, let's look at uh, people with a house of uh, equal value and what they're getting in return as compared to me and my house. Uh, uh, and so that's, that's what I was saying that the, the, I think that is that we still have work to do to take some of those kinks out of the system. I mean, that people are better educated. It's no longer 1948, 49. It's, uh, and so people may be not as articulate as they need to be on the point, but the point is a good one, and that is is taking these kinks out of the system. If I'm going to be asked to do five bucks in taxes for my house, I want to be treated as people who give five bucks for uh, right. being able to have the house here. Uh, that, that makes more 
sense and, and smacks to me on its face as something that uh, at least strongly approaches uh, 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 equality. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I gotta say this, I was laughing, I was told my wife, uh, I said, come in here, they're gonna create an, a war on poverty in Washington. And then I laughed and I said, Hillary's gonna be a little late. Hell, we did that already. <laughs> uh, and and it's, 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 it is important. We keep coming back to these subjects, right? We talk about the income inequalities and all. Man, we rode that animal into the ground and, and at the end of the day, there were a lot of good Americans that stood up and said, enough of that already. Uh, no longer a real big problem. We're gonna move on to another problem. And so we go deal with another problem. It is a really big problem. And it, it, and, and it, it, is, it is inflated by this other piece of the, the action, which is this inequality based on how, how people look or how they speak or mm -hmm. those kinds of things. So, One of the things that, that I heard um, from the group is it seemed like perhaps Tina, Christy, you were taking inclusion a little less problematically yeah, right. than, yeah. than mm -hmm. Walter and Robert. Right. And on that, on that point, and you, you sort of, you already made that observation yeah. in a way, but on, I, I guess on that point, to think about specific things that each of you said and then turn it back to the group. Um, so Tina, on the one hand, you object to the sacrifice, but you, talked a lot about some pretty big sacrifices that were being made in order sure. to live in this world of that you see is not sacrificial of you know people who are fighting and dying mm -hmm. in order to establish these things. Mm -hmm. um, and then Christy, when you were talking about the enlightened self-interest is kind of the way to get out of this uh, in a way, um, I started thinking of what happens when that, and, and it reminded me of delayed gratification and you were it's kind of another yeah. way in which to conceptualize what you were getting at. Oh, that's from a more self-interested perspective, I guess. But, but I began to wonder what happens when that enlightened self-interest or delayed gratification becomes intergenerational to really see the ultimate benefit when it's beyond one person's life sure. and into another. And then it does begin to feel like you can't get out of that box mm -hmm. by using what works for walking your dog no, it doesn't I, yeah. work the same way, and so, yeah. so I guess I, I guess the thing I'd want to put back is is there a, is there a way to bring these perspectives more in in line, or are these tensions just where you start and how you think about these things? The setup was probably clearer than the question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think the the inequalities are are huge, and I certainly didn't want to to write them off in what I was saying. But I, I wonder if some of these inequalities are exacerbated by the fact that we tend to think of our civic responsibilities as being sacrifices. How many people really like to go sit on a jury? How many of you sigh and go, ugh, I can't believe I just got called for I, jury I had an duty? Interesting time, actually. <laughs> I like jury duty. I did, they didn't pick me, though. I yeah. thought I'd be an excellent jurist, yeah. but I, I wasn't selected. Um, I was very disappointed. Uh, but I think we think about these, these obligations that we have in our communities, and whether this is the, these are political communities or geographic communities or cultural communities, I think we often tend to think of them in terms of, oh, what, what do I have to give up to do this? And I think this perpetuates this kind of atomistic thinking that we have, that we're all these individuals floating around and that we're not part, part of a larger whole. And I wonder if, if when we start to think a little bit more collectively about the problems and challenges we have, if we'll be more ready to address these huge inequalities that are not only problematic, I think they're more pro problematic than many people realize. Um, Other thoughts about it? Well, I, you know, <clears throat> before I realized I only had five minutes, I started to write a paper. And the beginning of my paper was to, to explain the, that uh, the difference that I presumed was going to be between the perspective that uh, Christy and, and others might take on this from being normative theorists to being people concerned first and foremost with the experience, of, as anthropologists are, with the lived experience mm -hmm. of, uh, of the people they, they work with. Uh, and so I think part of the difference for me from that, I don't demur completely from from the descriptions that either Tina or, or Christy uh, gave, 
But as an anthropologist, uh, it's, you know, I'm burdened with having this comparative perspective. It's not just, uh, just the way we, we would like to do it here through uh, democratic institutions. There are other societies that live in different ways. And so I think part of the tension is just a, a perspectival one, from, from, at least from my disciplinary perspective. Other things that the group wants to put out there to each other. You're quieter in the Q and A than I thought. <laughs> well, we had Tina, you were you were you were. I would, yeah. Well, so what? Where? Any? No, I, I think we should open it up for, for questions from the audience, and then that might spark a little more rather okay. than us trying to synthesize each other's yeah. ideas. Let's do so. Okay, so we've got two microphones. Whoever wants to ask a question, make a comment, please raise your hand. <laughs> one, two, okay. Okay, we've got one gentleman here. We'll take this, this one here and this gentleman here. We'll go you first and then you. I am freezing to death. All right. Hello? Okay. So, hello, my name is Carrie Vaughn, and my question is more for Tina because listening to you, I felt like you didn't, I mean, I felt like you just switched the view of sacrifice. I mean, I, I was thinking about it in terms of, you're not necessarily saying there's not sacrifice, you're just kind of saying, look at that cup half full instead of half empty. I mean, that still requires, there's still sacrifices there. I think it's just a different view to look at it. What would you say to that? I mean, is that what you're going for? Or were you actually trying to say that sacrifice isn't needed? I, I think that sac maybe it is a, a reframing of it from a negative to a more positive light. But I don't think that we should think about these things as giving, giving up something. When I pay my taxes, yeah, I'm giving up a little bit of my paycheck, I suppose. But it's, I, I don't feel like this is some grievous harm that is done to me. I don't feel like I'm suffering a personal loss or a forfeiture of something. I feel like this is my commitment that I have to make to others so that everybody here can drive on safe roads, so that everybody can have access to, well, in theory, everybody, and this brings us to the equality <laughs> issue, Right, but it's, it's what I do to ensure the things that I benefit from and that we all benefit from. And we have a, a tendency, I, I think, to think about these as burdens, you know, as these things that I, oh, woe is me, I have to suffer through my taxes and jury duty um, and all sorts of other things, instead of thinking about these as being the, the commitments and obligations we have to uphold uh, all of the other rights and benefits and privileges that ought to come with citizenship, although they, those may not be equally distributed. Um, can I add oh, yeah, one thing to yeah. that? Yeah, sure. well, it, and it seems to me that um, one reason we think of them, or one sort of framework in which we think of them as burdens, something to be taken away, something is taken away from us, is because we persist in thinking about, not surprisingly, there's the government and then there's us. You know, the, the government is imposing these burdens on us. It is make, taking our ta money away in the form of taxes or it is regulating us in ways that we find inconvenient or hurts our business rather than say, thinking, as it's easy to do when we're being theoretical here, we're all part of a, of, of a civic community and therefore we've all collectively made these decisions. Yeah. A lot of you have talked about the role of citizens as trying to participate in different aspects of our lives and communities in order to uphold the privileges that are granted to us. But in cases of extreme inequality, which may even sometimes be exacerbated by the government and exacerbated by the very institutions in place that give us these duties, what are our duties to try and change that and fix that and maybe even fight against something which may be traditionally considered a duty of our citizenship? When is it our duty to hold up a law that might be unjust? When is it our duty to protest that type of law? That's a great question. Is that directed to anyone in particular or the whole group? Um, I would say the whole group, okay. although yeah. I'm very interested in um, Tina's response to that. Just, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just because she talked how 
about how people are constantly fighting for yeah. rights and yeah. how um, it's been a long, strenuous process of history. Sure. But you also mentioned um, very like specifically some of the institutions that are in place right now as a result of that history and part of a process of an ongoing and changing history. So. Yeah. Um, so I think there can be little doubt that there is inequality, that there is inequality in all sorts of ways, from access to resources, inequality of opportunity, inequality of wealth, inequality of voice. I think we, we see a lot of these things. And I would argue, um, and I would argue that then we do have an obligation as a larger community, as larger groups to stand up and, and do what is necessary and do what is right to ensure that everybody uh, has access, has voice, has those things. So I think that part of being a good citizen is standing up for the rights and privileges of others. Um, and perhaps we don't do that enough, uh, or, or as loudly or as vocal as we should. But for me, that's what being a good citizen is. It's, it's standing up for the, the rights and needs of the collective over my own personal self-interest. Other thoughts on that one? Well, the, I got the, partly where I was trying to go in my comments about this is that we're going to have an extraordinarily difficult time taking what I call the, the wrinkle out of the garment um, without dealing with some of these issues that, that come from uh, the gross inequalities that we find in different places in our society. So it's to the advantage, I would argue, of those who have been blessed, if you will, uh, to, to work hard uh, to take those kinks out, because uh, looked at it from a little different perspective, they have a great deal to lose. Uh, and I, I still haven't come to the point that those privileges and blessings are guaranteed regardless. I don't, I don't think that at all. And I think uh, American history has, has pointed out, I think, so, so we had had enough, if you will, of having it pointed out to us that that isn't necessarily the, the, the case. That the have-nots uh, can have a tremendous impact uh, on the society within which they are, are dwelling. Uh, so I think that's a piece of it. I think it's, it's understanding one's own interests at one level and, mm -hmm. and what can I do to to make sure that the road continues to go like this uh, for me and, and, and whatever your group is, as opposed to us to end up in these, and, and that, that can come again. And we've gone through a small spate of that. I say small, only a few communities here recently uh, where it was starting to do this again. And uh, there are folks as old as I am and, and, and some older who remember those. And, those are really some scary times, and you come to the point that you understand you can break the tricycle. You can break it so that the tricycle doesn't work right. anymore. Right. So uh, it's, I, I'd argue it's, in your, it's a matter of self-interest, too. So let's see. We'll get Shana over here and this gentleman. You had your hand up before, so we'll get the two of you here. Um, so I noticed there are no economists on the panel, and so I was wondering <laughs> if how the answers would be different if we had included some of our economist colleagues, and and what the harm would be in recognition that citizenship does require sacrifices, that taxes may be a sacrifice, and that the draft and the eminent domain, and that there are there are things in our civic life that do require sacrifice, and what would the harm be in recognizing that? I, I think partly the harm in recognizing that, or from my point of view, the harm in recognizing that is what is the um, sort of uh, conception of a society and of citizenship that that uh, brings, entails, and, and I think I don't know, somebody else characterized it this way, but it's just, it's, it's the liberal view, and it's, we're all individuals, and we all have these particular, easily defined, well-defined, sh very short-term, I would argue, interests mm -hmm. um, that don't carry on into future generations. You know, my interest is in making as much money as I can. It doesn't matter if I'm polluting things, because that's down the road. That's in a different generation. And so I think that both is dangerous for society, and the polity, but it also 
looks at citizenship simply in, not surprisingly, kind of economic trade-off terms. You, you do what you can to preserve your own financial, economic self-interest, rather than some of the uh, things that I think I was talking about, the benefits you get from being in a group and cooperating with other people and making collective decisions. Not, not only that the decisions are better, but that you become a smarter, better, more effective, more affectionate person, kind of. So, yeah, I, I, not that I prohibited us from including economists, and it would have been interesting to have somebody here, but maybe Grant invited them and they didn't come. No, Is that no right? it was, <laughs> it was it's, a, it's a Campbell Institute thing. Oh, Anyone else want to comment on Shana's question there? And I know I, I would agree with Christie's response. Go ahead, sir. Hi, um, my name is Michael Messina Yahtzee. We, we live in a social order that doesn't spread equally the ability um, to participate in civic life. I don't want to assume a ground in which everyone has the economic security and the leisure to participate. Civic participation is easier for some than for others. Some occupations, such as that of professor, make <laughs> civic participation easier. Not an accusation, just an acknowledgement. Uh, those who are working um, at physical labor, maybe two jobs, struggling to survive, civic participation is hard. And yet it may be necessary. They may feel that it's necessary. Um, the influence of wealth in politics is becoming greater every year. People feel that as a threat to their livelihoods, to the, their personal health, to the health of their environment, to their personal safety, for the well-being of their families. My work puts me into a lot of contact with people who participate in social movements, mm -hmm. activists, people who I believe sacrifice a lot for what they see as the greater good. You can call it enlightened self-interest. You can call it... Um, taking part in something that maybe in some ways they don't see as a sacrifice because they're getting the satisfaction out of that mm -hmm. of doing something that they care about. And yet in doing so, and we can look historically at the struggles for civil rights where people uh, lost their, their health and their very lives to struggle to have political rights. But people are sacrificing when they are responding to what they see as the threat of inequality upon their lives, they're responding in a way that they sacrifice time with their families, time pursuing their own economic security even, time spent in pursuing leisure activities that they might enjoy. I think of that as a sacrifice. It may be a necessary sacrifice. It may be a sacrifice that those people choose to make. But the threat of inequality is largely what is requiring of them that sacrifice. More a comment than a question, but thoughts on it? Any of you? I take the point that, 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 this, that this inequality is, is an issue that gets enlightened when we talk about citizenship as a high-level concept, um, and that uh, people sacrifice in different ways. Uh, I thought, uh, I have to go back, uh, uh, when you were describing taxes and paying taxes so that you hoped that the roads would, uh, would yeah. be good, I thought, wow, that sounds a lot like somebody making a sacrifice to try to influence the, uh, the outcome of things. So uh, sacrifices come in different ways for different people and, the, and, they, and families and groups, and they, and they do this with the resources they have. And clearly, the sort of multiple levels you describe are, uh, are important. And I, I would just jump in to say that the social movements and activism and organizing in your community, whether that's at a political level or simply just to go clean up your park, that those are all examples of citizenship and taking civic duty to heart and enacting that. So, and, and critical ones. I think citizenship is, and civic duty is more than just voting. Absolutely. So to draw, to draw on those two, let me just push, push you a little, the group a little further on this, both to Shana's question and... Michael's question, um, is, are the differences that you're having mostly rhetorical here? 
My dad, when I was telling my dad about this, he said, Tina, you're just playing with the words. Okay. <laughs> and told me that my use of sacrifice was, was uh, that I was just trying to be fancy with my words. But I think it's more than, than rhetorical. And I, I think when we get down to it in the questions of inequality, and Shannon's question is, uh, you know, these two different views, I, I think, and this, this may be um, a dangerous thing to say, uh, and, and maybe it's intended just to be a little more provocative than not, but I think this, this view of uh, kind of the individual and the economic, the individual economic view assumes that markets will take care of all. And I think that history has shown us that market doesn't, markets don't take care of all. We have tremendous wealth inequality. We have inequality in, in lots of different ways. We have tremendous environmental pollution. Markets aren't taking care of that. We have infrastructural problems, and markets aren't taking that. And so to assume that there's just an economic answer to all of these things, I, I think is, is dangerous. And I would, would push everyone in this audience to identify one particular policy area where we're doing well. And where are we really doing well? What are we, what are we rocking at? Um, and I think that this, this view that markets can solve all problems um, is challenging, and I'm not sure that the evidence bears it out. And that's not to say that economics is not important, because I believe it absolutely is, and there's, there's absolutely a critical role. But, but I would like for people, at least in the context of citizenship, to at least momentarily broaden their view and think about things. This gentleman in the back here, and uh, we get uh, here at Ralph. Over here. I like your dad uh -huh. so much. He's awesome. <laughs> my dad's the best. All right, so, <clears throat> hi, my name is Scott. So, to me, when you talk about being a good citizen, it means that you have to be well informed of what's going on. Put the microphone up near you. We're at the grip over here. Is it on? Okay. You just have to hold it. Okay, all right. Sorry, I have a horrible voice. So to me, uh, being a good citizen means you have to be well informed. So when we talk about sacrifice, do you guys believe that citizens sacrifice when they take the time to go vote, when they take the time to read the newspaper, when they take the time to watch TV to understand the politics of what's going on in their local community uh, and on a national scale? Mm -hmm. Time is the one thing you'll never get back. So I'm sticking with that economics. <laughs> I mean, one way to look at that is, you know, you're always, you know, unless you did absolutely nothing with your time except whatever you wanted to do with it, you're always sacrificing. I mean, you're sacrificing to hang out with your friends or to help your mother or to, uh, you know, be involved in your fraternity and go to meetings. I mean, they're just... Everything you do is a sacrifice in that way. Um, but I think what you're perhaps making the decision, you'll, you'll probably accept all that as not necessarily being a sacrifice, just something you want to do. I think what, what Tina and I were kind of pushing back at is the idea that this other category of things, you know, getting better informed, voting, participating in civic life, is somehow different from all the, the other choices you make, which you don't see as a sacrifice. If you have a more organic view of we're all in this together, this is citizenship, uh, even let's call it being part of a community, not even mm -hmm. calling it uh, whatever your community is, whether it's Syracuse University or your neighborhood or your family, that you do things for that community. And yeah, sometimes it's a pain in the butt. You know, Maybe this is a sacrifice then. But a lot of times it's not. It's just part of your being a part of that community. I'm not, probably not being completely articulate, but does that make sense? Other thoughts? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're asking us, sorry. <laughs> Ralph. Yeah, when I first saw the title, Citizenship and, and uh, uh, Sacrifice, the words didn't seem to me to belong on the same page. Hmm. And I, I think what Christy and Tina have said uh, fleshes that out. And I, I think, th think of two other words that ought to be there that condition everything we want to do as participates in self-government in a democratic society. The two words, instead of sacrifice, that we want to put there are obligation and opportunity. Hmm. Obligation and opportunity. And that, that's, it's opportunity in the sense that citizenship allows you to become a fuller human being 
It, it allows you to develop your moral character. And that's, you don't sacrifice when you do that. You're, you're, you're enhancing your own uh, person as a member of a self-governing community. So not sacrifice, that's, that's not the state of mind that one wants to be in. One wants to think of this as opportunity and obligation, and then you get the basis of citizenship. Can I say one thing to the people in the, in the auditorium who are Max 123 students? Um, that person who you just heard from is Ralph Ketchum, who you have read. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who is a rock star in Max 123. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. That was great. Other was comments than Christie's on obligation and <laughs> Well, let that well uh, you know, at, at, the, at the risk of going up against a god here, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, Ralph, the things that, that you said, they make sense, but they, they are framed within a particular view of, of political institutions that don't hold necessarily across... I mean, citizenship applies... To all, to all sorts of polities that are governed by all sorts of political processes other than democratic, self-participatory processes. And so even though I didn't like the question of sacrifice, although I did say to, to Grant when he invited me, I don't really want to do it, but I guess I'm a member of the Campbell Institute, I'll make a sacrifice, <laughs> that, uh, that one of the troubles with, with the discussion of citizenship is it's, it's very uh, centered on our particular understandings of democracy, democratic institutions uh, in, in our own experience. Let's see, we'll get uh, this gentleman here and... A uh, young kid. We'll get this gentleman here. Yes, really young. Um, my question. Well, you hear me anyways. Uh, my question is about this. Just hold it up. My question is more about this uh, focus on the group versus the individual, and um, so in certain circumstances, um, almost this idea of the tyranny of the majority mm -hmm. over the individual, um, which is obviously something you know we talked about human sacrifice, and that might be a little extreme, hopefully, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But in a real world setting, you could say something like the Vietnam War, where a lot of young Americans did not want to go fight. And even though the majority in the group of Americans decided this is what you should do to be a good citizen, and this is what the leaders want you to do, then is it wrong for the individual to stand up and say, no, I don't. I don't agree with this, and I don't want to be a part of this. You know, I'm the one that has to give up my life. And this idea that you have, you know, about is it, they're standing up against the government, which is essentially the democracy. You know, that's another discussion. But um, you know, the individual is really their rights versus the societies. And if they think that it's wrong, you know, do they have that? right and responsibility to stand up and say, no, you know, uh, I'm looking at it from my point of view, and is that, you know, is this an example and maybe an exception to the rule of looking at yourself instead of the group as a whole? Well, since you've, since you've referenced the Vietnam War and, and the draft, uh, I guess maybe we can speak to it that way. Okay. Arthur Paris wants to say something. What? Only if you get a microphone. Is it okay with you? Yeah. yeah I, I mean, Sold. you're Start waving there. at me. <laughs> yeah. We're flexible here at State of Democracy. Uh, um, uh, I'd like to address um, the, the gentleman's point. Arthur, uh, why don't you make this briefest introduction? Tell everybody who you are. So you're gonna you're gonna take this on. You're gonna. My name is Arthur Paris. Okay. <laughs> On the Maxwell faculty. Oh, and, and, uh, I am a Mac I, and I am a Maxwell faculty Thank member. You. Um, let me just follow uh, Professor Rubenstein and say that um, um, it, the way you frame the question uh, ignores uh, a, a lot of context. Right? Um, and um, so you ask the question, and I respond and say 
that um, uh, because I was there okay, right, uh, in, that, in that historical moment, okay, that it turned out that um, a lot of folks who look like me were being asked to sacrifice their lives yet again, uh, which they had been asked to do in the, in the Korean War, in the Second World War, in the First World War, and they did not have citizenship rights. Okay, right? So uh, to ask those folks who look like me or you know, other folks who we could um, uh, categorize in, in similar ways to, to be citizens, what does that mean? And then uh, uh, not only that, but um, if you are asking it as an individual, you are ignoring the status of um, uh, obligations uh, uh, burdens that those individuals uh, carried by being members of a group which was stigmatized in that way. Right? So was their participation uh, at, and or refusal to participate, was that legitimate or not? I mean, what do you, you understand what I'm, what I'm pr pressing you on, right? No, that, was, that was my question, is, is it legitimate that if you, if you don't want to sacrifice because you think the cause is illegitimate, then is that going to run? Yeah, but I'm, I'm framing it and saying that it's, you have to put it in the context, have to frame it in the context of these group um, um, burdens, okay? That it's not just an individual question, okay? So Robert, so, so Robert wants to be, jump back in here. Go ahead. So, so what I was going to say is that, um, and I was, I was also subject to the, to the draft and, and during the Vietnam era, as I'm sure other people in this room were, there were folks who objected to that, and uh, they, those objections were sometimes totally self-interested. I don't want to die. Uh, I don't want to go, go over there and get shot. Uh, and then, uh, or broken in other ways. And, and there were people who objected as well, who had a more, a, a broader, like, I don't want anybody to, to be killed uh, as, over this. And then there were people, as Professor Paris says, who were also saying, Look, this draft is totally uh, unequal. There are folks who get out of it because they're going to school and can afford to go to school when uh, other folks uh, can't. So uh, I think the, from a citizen's, okay, so sort of breaking my faux attempt to represent all of anthropology, as an individual, uh, you know, you have a, res I ha felt I had a responsibility to stand up and counsel people in, uh, about the draft, to, to resist, to, to sabotage the induction center in Syracuse, to do all these things. But when people decided that they could no longer be in the society and went elsewhere, like to Canada, they made a real sacrifice, not knowing whether they would be able to return. So. There's multiple levels, multiple considerations, but yes, I think being a citizen of, of a community means participating and taking what risks there are to take if you believe in what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. I want to make sure we get this gentleman's question, and you'll have the last question, so if you could be brief in the question, brief in the answer, and then, and then I'll have a couple of concluding remarks, so go ahead, sir. Um, I was wondering, does, like being a citizen does call for sacrifice, but what happens when that sacrifice is asking too much of one person or of an entire group. Do you think that, like, do you think they have an obligation to themselves as well, not just to the society? I was really wondering that because being in the draft, it it does call for a lot for that one person. But what if they if they're not about it, if they're not for it? It was very similar to his question. Yeah. Christy, did you want to, you sound like you wanted to jump in on that? Well, I think we always are, are taking into account our, we can't not take into account our individual interests or preferences or concerns about ourselves, fears for our safety, all those things. I mean, all that can't be and shouldn't be discarded. Um, I mean, the draft is, is interesting. I mean, in a perfect, a more perfect situation than we had where uh, in the Vietnam era or other eras where um, people could opt out in various ways. So therefore the people who were randomly chosen were unequal in a sense. If you look back at World War II, as I understand it anyway, that draft was much more um, 
uniform. I mean, it was all men between the ages of 21 and 35 had registered for the draft and were more or less equally susceptible to being sent to war, as I understand it. That seems to be quite a different, so that, that addresses some of Arthur Paris's concerns. Uh, it doesn't address the concerns of the individual people like my father and other people's fathers who were, you know, put in harm's way. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the kind of sacrifice, and we haven't really talked about that, right. that uh, yeah. citizenship yeah. might might demand. Obviously, some people would feel that that was beyond what they should be asked for. But well, if I understand you correctly, I mean, you're saying, but what if I disagree and it's not good for me? I don't see this as being good for me. What can I do? Well, the the famous, you know. Uh, statement by Muhammad Ali, I mean, got right to that. And he says, this, this doesn't do anything for me. Uh, killing a bunch of North Vietnamese doesn't help me. My problem is right here. And this is what I need to be focused on. So there, this, this, this self-interest keeps popping up its head. And I think that it becomes a useful part of the discussion if you understand where you're trying to go with it. If it's just simply to continue to broaden your self-interest, uh, then I think that's where the trouble comes in. Uh, because groups can g gain and sustain enough power and influence to be able to sort of sequester, if you will, a tremendous amount of influence in, in these various communities. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you've got to be thoughtful about, hey, if I don't do this, uh, and the community comes into play, uh, is that not a good thing for me too? I mean, I may extend my freedom by six months, uh, but then some other things could happen as well, if, if the dangers are legitimate and the kind of thing you're working against. But no, I mean, I, I'd encourage you to look at that old, that old tape of him there. It was, it was crystal clear to him that, look, I mean, killing people is a big deal. So, you know, I don't want to kill people who have done, from his point of view, hadn't done anything that, that hurt him. So he wasn't going to be one to go out and take people's lives. I think that's a, that's a good spot to end at least this part of the conversation on. Let me just say this as a way of concluding it. Uh, first, before doing that, I'll remind you, if we have a nice reception <coughs> outside, or we can continue the conversation. But I'll just say this. Uh, I, I think for the wrong question, uh, this generated a, a lot of really interesting discussion <laughs> that I'm going to be thinking about. It was, I think, very, very insightful and content-rich and provocative. So thanks to the four of you for being willing to <laughs>